Yep, yep, yep. Hey, Dave Meltzer on the line, everybody. Uh, I don't... You know, I always feel like I have to do an intro for you because, like, traditionally, when you bring someone in on a show, you got to do an intro. But everybody knows who you are here. Yeah. No okay. intro needed. Uh, Dave, yeah. I'm ex- thank you for coming on, obviously. Uh, a little short notice a couple days ago, but, of course, uh, you, you, you said thank you. Uh, you know, you said uh, I'll come on, and I'm very appreciative of, of it. There's a lot going on, and I thought this would be a good topic to start off because I kind of got my butt handed to me over my NXT statement a couple days ago. Um Pretty much, I, th- I think, you know, I sent you I sent you an email and I sent you a tweet and we were talking about it. Uh, I spoke to Brian about this also, but, uh, you know, the, the restructuring of NXT has been a topic that a lot of fans uh, want to get more information about as to why and how and what's going on. And, you know, obviously we don't know everything and we can't go into everything, but I do think this is a good, exi- you know, good opportunity to talk about this. In the long run, do you think this reshuffling is going to work for them as far as, you know, the back end stuff and even even the presentation of the product? So far, it hasn't. Um, it's, it's too early to say long run. I mean, I understand what they're trying. It also hasn't worked, and it's also stripped the company of what it what its popularity thing was. You know, I mean, the thing that made it the cool thing, it's all pretty much gone, and now it's purely developmental. With, with guys that are very green. I mean, even years ago when it was developmental, you had a lot of independent guys with a lot of experience, so you had some really cool matches, and you had JR announcing and things like that. Um, this is back on the, the early network days before it, um, you know, even pre-takeover. Um, and now it's, um, you know, it's just a lot of uh, very green talent on national television, which makes it worse in some ways. But... Um, you know, in the long run, is the new thing going to work? I mean, I think that one of the things is, is they probably looked at the old thing and just go like, this isn't performing at the level that we want it to, so we've got to make changes, and these are the changes that they made. And also, the idea of NXT as a touring group, obviously, with the pandemic, has been completely dropped. They don't even do local house shows. So it's all about just, um, they've turned it into just pure developmental with the kind of people who they think have a future on the main roster, and... uh you know, I mean, we know how they think about talent. I mean, it's it's the, the the real interesting thing is the dichotomy of the Vince McMahon feeling of talent and the Tony Khan feeling of talent. And in the long run, not that this is the be-all and end-all, but it's a very key thing in what's going to happen going forward. Tony Khan's idea is to use, you know, really good wrestlers um, that are experienced and make their way through and, and everything. And Vince's idea is to find good looking people and train them to be, you know, with the right, with the people with the right look, by good looking, I mean, good bodies and whatever, and train them to be pro wrestlers because that's what will draw you money when they're good enough and they're, and they're being trained for the main roster. And the thing, the thing on that is, is because I could certainly recall OVW uh, when they first started, the difference was is OVW was this little cocoon and outside of Louisville, nobody saw it. And I think that it's probably best with that mentality to not be on even on the network to 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 do like a local thing and probably give the people some local house shows in the area and just do on on like a local station and have people not see them because by seeing them you're you're kind of like showing people you know the first impression is always like the lasting one and you're seeing a whole bunch of people the first time you see them they're not ready and you just kind of go oh they're not that good It'd be so much better if it's two years down the road the first time you really see these guys, especially on television, and they're a lot more polished and they still have the good look. You know, I think that that's probably better in the long run, but they have this TV show that they have to fill two hours every Tuesday night. So this is what they're filling it with. I mean, even if the show was an hour, I think it would be a far easier show to watch, especially with, you know, considering it's developmental. You know, I, I don't know if you were said the same thing. Uh, I was told, I, I called somebody over there uh, early in the week when, when the, um, to kind of touch on a report online, uh, Russell Votes had a report, uh, and then plus this kind of piggybacked on the Toronto Star story. But essentially what was said to me, and, and this is, I mean, I've, I've heard this over the last year, that that model of NXT that people fell in love with was unsustainable moving, moving ahead in 2022. And I, and I asked them what they meant by that, if they meant financially or, or just the way that they were training people. And what was, I mean, the example was give me the top stars over the last, I, in, you know, NXT PC developmental era from like 2013 on. 
who were the top guys that came out of there onto the main roster that were developmental guys? And really, if you think about it, it, it very, very few. The women, Baron, Cor- yeah, I mean, the women, they've done uh, night and day, right? Astronomically, yeah. uh, what an improvement over how they train them. But as far as the men go, it would be Baron Corbin, uh, Braun Strowman. And maybe FTR, if you're going to consider them, you know, homegrown. They worked in. They'd worked indies forever. Yeah. So, and so I would not. Cons- I wouldn't consider like them or Adam Cole or anything like that. Those people were all experienced people and really good. Um, Jason Jordan and Chad Gable could have fit in that category. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, but yeah, no. I mean, it's it's. You know, it's funny because I had a conversation with somebody there. Um, not too. You know, it was the last time they were in San Jose. And one of the things that I sort of said was that um, a lot of the athletes that go there that were brought in, because remember, they recruited all kinds of great athletes, and so many of them, like in the old days when you would recruit great athletes, some of them just didn't like wrestling and would quit. But for the most part, the ones who liked wrestling, they would make it and often make it big. Um, you know, not everyone, because some, some people didn't have the charisma. But the thing is, is... Um, <clears throat> You had these guys coming in. Just throw Baron Corbin's name out just because it fits. Um, who's you know good enough athlete to have had a cup of coffee in the NFL? I mean, never played. I don't think he ever played in a regular season game, but he was in camp. But he's a big guy, agile guy. You know, good athlete. Um, and he comes in, and he's used to kind of everywhere he's gone being like you know a really good athlete. Maybe on an NFL roster, not so good, but you know, like all through high school and everything like that. He was better athlete than everybody. Goes into this new thing, professional wrestling, goes into this train school knowing nothing, and he's in there with these guys that have had 15 years of experience, and they're running rings around him. And it can be very disheartening to be like the worst guy. And some guys may thrive on that and improve, but for a lot of guys who are used to being the front runners, it's really tough. And I was, you know, it was almost like, by having so many great guys like the Johnny Garganos and everything there, you'll have these guys come in and go, oh, my God, like, this is, I could never do this. Or these guys are so, so far ahead of me, I'm trying this. And it's, it's like you almost, like, mentally give up. Um, and, and I thought that that was one of the reasons why their ability to make these athletes into top pro wrestlers, um, you know, there are, you know, a few, you know, I mean, Roman Reigns, Bray Wyatt, um, you know, became big, big stars and all, but, um, but they're also both second generation guys who grew up. I mean, as far as like pure guys with no connection to the business that came to the PC, um, that were like good college football players that end up being you know quality WWE guys for the amount of people that you know, or, or, or great amateur wrestlers. Um, you know, I mean, like yeah, Gable and Jordan. Um, and Jordan didn't end up panning out due to injury, but it's like the number is very very small. Very. And and it is it is like um, I mean that is something. Um, so I'm not saying that's the reason I'm sure it's not actually, but it is something that I had been thinking about for years when Sami Zayn and Finn Balor and those guys were in NXT and, and they were recruiting all these, you know, national champion, you know, or all American wrestlers that would come in and they would never get anywhere. And my thought was, is that they're just looking at these guys who are so much better pro wrestlers than them and just get frustrated. And it's mentally difficult. You know, when you're a national champion wrestler, You've been running through people you're through from high school, all through college, running through people for the most part. And I'm not saying it comes easy to you because you had to work hard for it, but you weren't starting out like so much worse than everybody. And that's, um, I think that there is something to that. I mean, as far as unsustainable financially, I mean, I don't know the whole situation, but the one thing is, is that with what they are doing, they desperately, I mean, I wouldn't put them on television, but they have to fill the airs, but they desperately need the house shows. Even if yeah. there are house shows in front of 300 people, they need to get that Florida thing going. And I know originally it was going to start July of last year, and now it seems like it's never going to start. And so because of that, these guys are going to progress a lot slower, and that's going to make it even more frustrating. Yeah, when I asked about that, that Florida loop, I was told a couple months ago that it's not in the plans. So yeah, it's not in the plans anymore. It yeah. was in the plans. It was in the plans at the start of last year. To you know, to to go not to tour anymore. I mean, I did hear no more national touring, which I which I could sort of understand because they didn't have the horses. Like if they went with with uh, the crew that they have now, national touring, they wouldn't do very well. Um, but you know, again, like if you're in like a 200 or 300 seat little building in Florida, 
Um, but one of the problems, uh, I mean, I remember being told is that like, oh, you know, go to some of these cities where the people are really anti-vax and there would be COVID problems and everything like that. And that was an, that was an issue at one point too. Um, I mean, there's so many different issues, but they, at some point, I know it's not in the plans, but if you're going to have like these, these guys that, you know, again, like you're looking, I, I just did the, 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 the thing in the, in this new issue talking about how many matches these people have. We're talking about like people having 13 matches in a year, 20 matches yeah, in a year. Yeah, which is not enough at all 10 matches in a year to improve you know you need way more than that so it's like they need to get these guys um they need to get these guys ring time or they're going to go on the main roster and they're not going to be ready no absolutely and, and they, I think, or they're never or, or they're never going to make it to the main roster yeah and, and then you have the other side of things where you know and and this was interesting that this name was brought up to me multiple times and nakamura has been brought up to me as an example of how what not that NXT didn't work, but Nakamura is used as an example of he should have never been there and it was wasted time for him to be there. And I think now in 2022, when you have so much television competition, whether or not you consider AEW competition as far as, you know, ratings go or which they are competition, they're competing ratings wise. They're competing as far as the key demo goes very aggressively with Raw. So a guy like a Nakamura or even a Keith Lee that was in developmental I mean, this guy was one of the hottest commodities on the independent circuit. I, I saw him tons of times, and, and he was having classic matches in the middle, you know, at Laboom in the middle of a nightclub for Evolve, and then you put him in NXT, and you don't show him on TV. You keep him there for a while, and then finally he's on TV. You put the title on him, you move him to the roster, and things fall apart. To me, what, what, what this person was saying was that we had it all wrong. We ended up having to become competition on TV. Uh, we ended up becoming Ring of Honor esque, and it kind of, kind of fell apart as far as the main goal of NXT. And I don't know if you've heard that or not, or if that's kind of the same. Yeah, message. no, no. The, the original goal of NXT was to develop talent, and instead they wanted to be basically what happened was Ring of Honor was starting. This was when, in the Young Bucks, Cody Rhodes era of Ring of Honor, and and um, where Ring of Honor was starting to get a buzz, and they didn't, you know, WWE is with WWE. I'm not saying they don't want anyone else doing pro wrestling. There's a period when they didn't want anyone else doing pro wrestling. I think now it's kind of like the UFC mentality. I think they're actually both very similar in the sense that they know that they need other people doing pro wrestling, but they don't want anyone doing it at a high level. Like, they don't really want anybody else (laughs) on television. But, you know, as far as local pro wrestling, they don't want to stomp that out. But they don't want it to get too popular either. If it gets too popular and gets too much of a buzz, they want to, like happened in the U.K. Well, the U.K. was basically to to, uh, stop ITV um, in its tracks, and, uh, and, 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 and look that at the was UKC now. I mean, look at the uh, uh, pre-COVID. Oh, so I mean, look at pre-COVID. It was getting really depressing, but even now, it, it, it's really devastated. Yeah, yeah, UK is devastated. Um, I mean, the thing is, is that they were, you know, Ring of Honor was getting popular, and they figured, like, why don't we do our own Ring of Honor? We can sign up all of their top guys and um, bring them into the thing and do the same thing, but with our production and everything like that. And Ring of Honor will go down, and we'll have that audience, that Ring of Honor audience. That was, like, the mentality. And for a time, I mean, it, it worked. They were, you know, they were, um, and, and, and may have continued to work. Um, but I think that what happened, I think that the two hours of TV and, and making it a fight on Wednesday, um, you know, they lost the fight. And, yeah. and that, that was the beginning of the end, you know, because you also had the thing from the top of like, you know, these guys lost the fight, and now we don't we don't want it to be that anyway. We don't want, you know, we we can't compare, but they still got they still got the two hours to fill. Once you're on national TV, putting on a subpar product doesn't work. Which, yeah, I think it's not a good. I, I don't think if I'm WWE, I do not want a subpar product on television. Yeah, and, even 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 people within WWE uh, and some of these guys I've had really honest discussions with, where you know. Sometimes you talk to someone, you're know, like, okay, they're playing the, the company line, you know, they're not going to say anything bad. And other times, like, even with even with NXT when they were on the network, out of that that taping of whatever, let's say the bulk of four shows, two were fantastic. The other two, eh, they, you could watch yeah. it or you could not, but it didn't really matter. And and when they transitioned to yeah, two hours, one, they had that. Problem. It was a one. It was a one hour show and it was an easy watch. Fantastic, um, easy, and there was very no. Easy. And there's no pressure on ratings because nobody, you know, the only people who had them was, was them. And it didn't matter because as, as long as they could, as long as the guys were getting television experience, um, you just basically say, you know, it's fine. You, you have developmental money. It's a loss leader. Every product, you know, does developmental, so to speak. 
You know, I mean, it's like the, they don't have college football, so they've got to create their own college football yeah. to, for, to, for the NFL. So, I mean, developmental is needed. Um, it's just a question of what is the right developmental. I mean, like, they had very, they had very good success for a little while with OVW, um, and then they didn't. Um, then they moved everything to Florida, and it really wasn't that successful. And then they had that period where they got very aggressive. And, and um, But, yeah, like the success of, of, um, of you know, NXT – was so much of the Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, Finn Balor, uh, Pac, you know, those, that, that era, um, the women, I mean, the women, the women were the ones that they can really hold their hat on, on, but, um, I mean, that was, um, but yeah, I mean, those people, like really everyone, every one of them had years and years and years of experience. And, you know, may, maybe they'll say NXT helped in the transition because there is a transition of doing, Lucha Libre in Mexico and WWE, and maybe this is a good transition. There is a transition from New Japan, whatever. But I don't know that Finn Balor needed all that time there, and and clearly Kevin Owens didn't because he was only there for a little while, and he was fine on the main roster. But um, but you know they wanted that idea that like I remember they they would in the prospectus or the business stuff would be like sixty eight percent of our main roster talent you know, came through NXT, and it's like. Yeah, Ten years of uh, independence, <laughs> finishing you know, school, six, right? That's how they months, saw six it. Months, Six months of NXT, you know, it's not really NXT, you know, but but using it as a way to say like, look, we're developing all this new talent. It's like, you know, you self developed some, but you know, really considering the amount of money, less than you should have. Um, but you know, if if this group that they have now in three four years all turns out, or not not all, they won't all, but it, like if a lot of them turn out to be stars, then it was successful. Um, and it's it's like too early to tell. Um, but yes, it did absolutely veer away from the original intent, and now it's back to the original intent because, you know, they were out there trying to compete in ratings with AEW, and and you know at first kill AEW, and then when that was unkillable, um, keep them down, and then you know that didn't work either. So then they, you know, went to the new the new thing that they're doing. Yeah, very. Their philosophy has totally shifted, which I find interesting. Now the big question here is what happens with Hunter. Right. Uh, I, I mean, what what do you see? How do you see this playing out with, you know, this is not Hunter's NXT. I don't think it'll ever be his NXT again. Um, have you heard? No, I mean, I see, I see, this? I see, I see, you know, Vince McMahon fingerprints all over that show. It's it, it's exactly what I would expect from a Vince show. I mean, as far as as far as Paul, I. Um, you know, I mean, it's, here's the thing. It's like, I don't know what his goal, you know, you know, when you get the health scare he's had with three daughters and everything, it's like your, your priorities change greatly or should, I don't know if he would even want that stress now. Maybe he would, maybe he wants to go right back and, and look, he loves wrestling. It's something he's watched since he was a kid. Um, he's not that old to where it's like, he wants to ride off in the sunset. Although I can't imagine him ever wrestling again. Um, but I guess that's possible too. But, um, I, you know, I don't know what he wants. Like, it may be something where he doesn't... I mean, I would, like, as a friend, kind of say, like, you don't need the stress. You've got yeah. the money in the bank, and, you know, the, the family's never going to be wanting. And take care of your health, because it's the most important thing in your life. Um, and running NXT is a high stress. You've got all of these athletes all trying for your attention. There's all these different things, you know, pulling each other, you know, apart. And that may, you know, be part of what the health issue was, is the fact that he had all that going on, and it's, you know, a hundred hour a, work, a week work week, which is which is a tough deal. Very tough deal. Very tough deal. Listen, at the end of the day, you know, when, when people look back at this era, uh, they look back at NXT and development and what they did, I, Hunter's going to be a big topic of discussion because he, he was the driving force behind this this boom in, in developmental talent or unheard of talent, that un Unnational, not nationally exposed talent for some of them. You know, uh, he he had the right eye to pick the best of the best and, and bring them in, and really created a, a fantastic era. I know plenty of people that got back into professional wrestling because of NXT, single handedly. Yeah, I mean, it was always wild. <laughs> I always thought it was not necessarily. I almost sometimes I used to think it was counterproductive where I would watch a Saturday night NXT show and then a Sunday pay per view. <laughs> it was the so NXT good. Show, yeah. And the NXT show would blow away the pay per view, yeah. and it's kind of like, <laughs> God, it sort of exposes your main roster, and um, you know, and, and the fans are so much more you know thrilled and everything. But the reality is, is the NXT you know didn't grow in popularity in the sense of 
you know, it really wasn't the main brand, even if it was the better brand. And it's also a lesson, you know, about how important uh, location is and production is and things like that, that you can go in there and have way, 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 way better matches and way, way, way better atmosphere. But the masses still want to see the people who are presented on the show that seems to be the more important show. I mean, it's, it's interesting to, you know, and again, it's like minor league baseball is never going to, outdraw Major League Baseball, even if they play more exciting games. And a prelim fight on a UFC show that's absolutely fantastic is never going to get the talk of a main event, on it, You know, even if the prelim fight is blows it away. I mean, yeah. it may get some talk, but in the long run, are those guys in that prelim fight going to draw on the next, you know, on the pay-per-view big numbers as compared to the, you know, pay-per-view main eventers that are established on top? You know, it's just, it's people want to see what they perceive to be most important. And the one thing as great as NXT was, and this may be, you know, you can maybe second-guess that late um, 2019 period where they were in Survivor Series and everything, and, and Paul was talking about third brand, and maybe if they had really treated it as a third brand and up the production, maybe they could have beaten um, AEW, um, and maybe it would have been a successful third brand, and maybe that's something that they would want, but they didn't follow up on the third brand thing. It became, you know, less and less a third brand and more and more our minor leagues. And our minor leagues has a built-in limitation. And, um, you know, in that sense, by going uh, against their major leagues, you know, originally the idea was that, that they were going to beat them, and they certainly didn't. And that was because the perception became that, hey, you know, you know uh, Adam Cole came in and beat Brian Danielson, so, man, I mean, he should be up there in big, big matches, and that didn't happen. There was yeah. no follow-up. You know, I mean, Charlotte Flair goes down there and beats everyone, and it's like, okay, that's cool, because in the end, someone's going to beat her. You know, Rhea Ripley's going to beat her at the end, and, and it's going to make Rhea a bigger star. And then that, when that never happens, it's, it more and more drives into people. It's like they're just the minor leaguers. And that was the worst. That was the kiss of death for them as far as being comp- competition for AEW. And also, um, you know, the fact that so many of the ones – went to the main roster and then weren't given a push, weren't even given a chance. And then it's like kind of like if you're a WWE fan who kind of wants to see the future of WWE, and you watch and you see, ah, this guy, he's NXT champion, he's going to come to WWE and do something, and then he does nothing. Um, Then it's kind of like, why am I watching, spending two hours watching this minor league stuff where none of these guys pan out? So now, now we have. Uh, I mean, to kind of to kind of veer, in, and this kind of plays plays a part. You brought up a third brand for WWE. You know, there's been a lot of discussion. Uh, can we use another, you know, a major organization, a third national brand uh, in North America? You know, we have an abundant amount of talent right now that's nowhere on TV with all the recent releases, and and you know, obviously AEW is going to be releasing some people soon, also with contracts expiring. Do you think there is a place in in pro wrestling right now on TV that you could have a competitive third brand on there? Um, I I don't want to say no 100%, but you're going to need really strong TV, and I don't know if you can get that. And you need a lot of money. Um, <laughs> That's ton the other of money. part. Ton of money. Ton of money. Well, you know, the thing is there's a lot of talent out there, but there's no um, Kenny Omegas and Chris Jericho out there. Yeah. You know, the people, the, the you know, young bucks, the people at the level where you can use them as the building blocks for other people. I mean, there's a lot of private parties out there, but private party without these other guys would never be anything. And, you know, Darby Allen, who did make it pretty big, you know, because he was whatever, you know, he worked with Cody Rhodes and he worked with all these other people and he, they linked Sting with him and everything and they made him into a star and they made Britt Baker into a star and things like that. But that's because they had some stars to make them. If you go in there with, you know, guys that were not stars in WWE, even if they were very good workers and you're going to use them, that's like, you know, American Wrestling Federation and all these people that tried to compete as the third group. The only one who really had any what I would call limited success was ECW, and that was because they were doing a completely different product. And even then, you know, I mean, ECW on today's scene, if they could get broadcast rights, maybe they would have even made it. Um, but without, you know, ECW didn't, you know, was never financially strong either. Um, but it did have, they at least had a cult following, um, and they did draw to a degree on pay-per-view and everything. I mean, they were, you know, at times they were probably more popular than WCW when WCW was dying. But, um, with with weaker TV, but still, I mean, like it was still TNN, which was a real station. You'd need to get the station. You'd need a lot more money than ECW had because the stakes are higher. 
Um, you basically need a TV station going like, hey, we want to get in the wrestling business and we're going to fund it. Um, it's not like, oh, we've got all these people that WWE cut, we've got a bunch of guys that AEW is going to cut that have been on TV, and we can put you know, familiar faces on TV. You know, Matt Cardona is like, that's not going to work you know, yeah. without the TV to back it. You know, that's Impact, and Impact has TV, but it's, you know, I mean, you can see the numbers that it does and, and the buzz that Impact has right now. Um, you know, it's there, it's, it's, it, but it's, and it's being kept alive by a television station because they want wrestling on their TV station, but it's not a, you know, it's a television station that's doing 100,000 viewers, not a television station where you put it on and do yeah, 600,000 600, viewers or something. You know, it, it's, it, I, it's a very fascinating time in pro wrestling uh, with, with everything going on. Uh, you know, WWE right now, they, they, they have solidified themselves as something other than pro wrestling. They've been telling us this for 25 years, and finally I think it's happening. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but going to, you know, going to All Out and, and seeing what a fantastic show that was and being a couple weeks prior, being at SummerSlam and seeing what a spectacle that was, uh, you could you could really feel like, especially for the big shows, like these are two very different, they have two very different philosophies. Yeah, they kind of look the same and they're doing the same thing in the ring, but it's not the same thing. They're, they're, they're their overall, I guess, mission statement or whatever they conceptualize, whatever their version of wrestling is, is very different. AEW, I lean towards a little bit heavier because it's the wrestling that I grew up with and I'm very comfortable with. WWE has become a, a, a television product. And not, I'm, not, I'm not saying but it's, it's always, but it's, it's, always it's, it's always been, though. It, it's always I mean, been, the, yeah. Yeah, the goal, the goal is still to make stars, though. You know, and, and, and the jury is out. There's so many arguments you can make, but the jury is really out on which philosophy is better at creating the larger audience. You know, people will look at WWE and go, well, they have the larger audience, but that's a lot of that is the 30-year head start, 50-year head start. Um, so you don't really know. In the long run, you know, as you know, one group is going up more than the other, so, but, that's, you know, but they still have to get to a certain point where you say, like, okay, they're now actually more popular. I mean, they're, they're close in some ways, um, closer than I would have imagined in some ways, but I still, like, if you go, like, What's the more popular group? It's WWE, and it's not really that close in the big picture. In some circles, it, it is close. And they are better at getting people to go to their live shows, which is a real feather in their cap that they are. But still, WWE is still the, the name brand that everyone grew up with, and that's an inherent huge advantage. And being based in the Northeast is a, also a huge advantage as opposed to being, you know, I, people don't even really know where AEW is based. I guess it's Jacksonville, Florida, but you have Jacksonville, Florida versus, you know, right, the outskirts of New York. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in that wrestling war, people, we would always go, if it was Jim Crockett who was running Madison Square Garden and Boston Garden and, and Philadelphia Spectrum, and it was Vince McMahon running the Charlotte Coliseum, does it end differently? And I'm pretty sure it does. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, and that's a huge. It's it's not as big an advantage now as it was in the '80s, but it's still a big advantage. Oh, it's, it's, the incumbencies, but yeah. the incumbencies a the incumbencies a giant advantage. Yeah, I, I think now you know for for AEW they've done they, they've done a fantastic job at you know bringing a lot of these disenfranchised fans back. I remember when when we were talking about when AEW is going to show up on TNT and what their first episode of ratings are going to be. Everybody that I spoke to that are that are you know quote unquote industry insiders with television. They, I mean, they were telling me if they do anything above seven fifty, it, it's going to blow their minds. And they did a million. Oh no! I mean, I I could tell you, and I know people who were in wrestling, and I mean, they were going four hundred to five hundred. Four hundred to five hundred. Yep, that is exactly because, because what I heard. Four hundred to five hundred. Oh point two. Um, you know, oh point two was was the basic thing, and this includes people in TNT who are just like, you know, what I'm going to like, what are you looking for? And it's like, well, you know, don't don't listen to the rating number because you know the the viewer number because we really don't care. Um, but 400 to 500 would be like a good number to throw out. But 0.2 is what we're looking at. Interesting. And obviously they, they've never fallen as low as an 0.2. I think the lowest they got, I think they once got to 0.24, um, on a Wednesday, which was when they were not doing well, but, um, you know, the, but yeah, they, they, they blew away. They blew away what most industry insiders thought. I mean, a lot of fans thought differently. But um, and they were in, and they ended up being more right than the in industry insiders. Yeah, uh, listen. Uh, sometimes, sometimes the people that are in the know are the ones that are really not. Uh, you know, they're kind of blinded by all their analytics and everything. And I, and that happens to me too. I get I get, you know, my background's in marketing and business and sales. And a lot of these guys I know. And they when AEW started out, I heard that five hundred thousand number and. 
when I when I even brought up can they do a million, it was almost like impossible. I don't. I hope so, but I no. But there's no indicator pointing it, and there would be no indicator. Turner hadn't had wrestling on for twenty some odd years. Uh, you know, the the landscape is different, and we're realizing that the fan base is very different. Yeah, of course, there's crossover, and you can talk about this with Brian Weekly. But the crossover isn't as much as people would imagine. It's not no. like ninety percent no, of it, WWE's audience, uh, Raw's audience, is tuning into AEW. It's not like that at all. I used to get the um, from one of the cable companies, and I wish I still did. But I would get like the Friday night crossover. I never did a Monday night to Friday, um, um, Friday night. But when when the NXT thing started, um, I mean when, the, when when Rampage started, I, I got the crossover of Rampage and SmackDown, and and it was. Um, you know, I forgot the numbers, but it was like 12 to 16 percent of the raw audience would watch even a minute of AEW. I mean, of the SmackDown audience, I should say, would watch like a minute of AEW. It was not much of a. I mean, it it absolutely exists. This is not watching the whole show of each. This is one minute of each show. You know, like like because look, I mean, even people who I know that aren't WWE fans, um, they could watch a minute of SmackDown before they're you know even if it's the last minute of the show, and that would count. And there's not, you know, even throwing that in, or, or vice versa, where you're a SmackDown fan. Oh, let's go to TNT and watch the first minute of Rampage. I don't like it, but let's just watch it. And that number is really small. I mean, when, when we did the thing with the pay-per-views, and granted, you know, that's a different metric, but the, the WWE still had, at that time, a lot of pay-per-view buyers. They don't, they don't really now, but, you know, when AEW started in 2019, there were, you know, there were, you know they would do 20,000, 30,000 pay-per-views and more for Mania. Um, it's not a small number. No, not at all. And most of them, most of them did not buy AEW shows. I mean, very few of them did. The AEW audience was a different audience. Now, it was the AEW audience on, you know, subscribing to the network and so watching the pay per views? Yes, yeah, some of them were, but most of them weren't. Yeah, I, I, very interesting stuff. Now, uh, before I let you go, obviously you're you're busy. We got GCW tonight. I have uh, Matt Ryan calling in in about thirty minutes from Catalyst Wrestling. Talk about independent wrestling right now with me, but. You know, how important is this for uh, wrestling in general or even even independent wrestling, you know, a, a third or fourth or fifth company to be able to run a venue like the Hammerstein? You know, GCW did it with no TV and they sold it out uh, based on, you know, online marketing and star power on that card. Uh, what do you what's your opinion on, on what they're doing tonight with GCW? Well, I mean, it does remind me of ECW in a lot of ways before they had national TV. I mean, they did. um and, you know, they were able to go places where they had no local TV and draw um, based on the buzz of ECW. And, and I think GCW has it. And then ECW had it when the, the, you know, social media was far, far less. So, I mean, I can see, I mean, what ECW did to me was more impressive. But that doesn't, you know, these guys may be in the early stages and everything like that. You know, more power to them. Everybody, everybody that runs independence wants to be in their shoes to where they could go in there and sell out a 2,000-seat building. Um, you know, and, and, you know, even go in and tour nationally and go into these places, like draw 800 people in Los Angeles, whatever it is, a couple times a year and sell it out, you know, yeah. sell out Los Angeles or do 1,400 people in the suburbs of Chicago and sell it out. I mean, it's, 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 it's very, very impressive what they've done. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of it was uh, Nick Gage, you know, and he's not on the show. Um, you know, a lot of Tonight's show is is the fact that there's a lot of familiar names on it. It's not just their guys, and a lot of them are AEW guys, which I find very interesting because I just find it interesting that, you know, like it's one thing like for Tony Khan to let guys do house shows, but it's another thing to let them do pay-per-view shows. I mean, real pay-per-view, not even internet pay-per-view, but real television pay-per-view. Um, you know, I mean, he just wants to be friends with everyone and, and wants to... You know, I, I mean, I think that the, some of it is like to be the opposite of what WWE is. WWE has convinced everyone that, oh, you know, our guys, you'll never see them on anything but our shows, and, and we would never let them do this. And AEW is letting, you know, Moxley, one of their top guys, Eddie Kingston, who's not on the show but was originally going to be on the show, um, you know, also, um, you know, one of their top guys, um, you know, Ruby is on the show. Let them do it and let them be on pay-per-view. That's a, you know, that's a very interesting um thing you know and it's i think that it's a good experiment for tony to think outside the box rather than have these you know people will go like well this isn't what wwe does it's minor league it's like yeah. 
you know, I mean, some maybe it's maybe it's not. Sometimes those out of the box ideas work. Listen, maybe um, maybe the you know we we talk about AEW running a stadium show. Uh, this is a discussion uh, you've had with Brian multiple times. We talk about it on Matt Men all the time. I, I spoke about it with Gary a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, when when those ticket sales happened. For that, all, was it all in or was it all out? Where they had like forty thousand people the, in the, queue. The first all out when they had seventy four thousand okay. five hundred people in line. Out of um, control for tickets. It, I mean, out of control if you think about it. And it and, blew. It blew everybody's mind. There's never been anything like it. And it's funny because it was like one of those things. It's like there's a moment in time because I remember people going, they should just book a stadium in Chicago in two months. And it's like no, <laughs> no, it's, it's no. timing. It's it's a timing thing. It was the right minute. It's like it's it, the match. Yeah, Moxley and Kenny was a a big big match. It was just a moment in time where there was this fear. It's like it's like the first time this rock band comes. It's like the second time they come. It may not be as big. Now, can they do something? Can they do a stadium show? I think that there is a time, and it even could be now, where they go in there and they have this fan base and just go. You know what? We are going to run a forty thousand seat stadium, and um, this is. And I think the first time they may just go in there. We are going to produce the biggest card in the history. You know, our WrestleMania, but don't use the term WrestleMania, obviously. Um, and see what you do. I think that they would be even the company itself would be surprised at how many people, if it's the biggest of the big, um, would go to a show like that just to be in the atmosphere and just because they think it's historic. I think the number's pretty high. Maybe when COVID's over, if that ever happens, because again, I'm not sure I would want to do that right now. But then again, WWE's doing what is it, five stadium shows this year? I mean, so they think that they can, and, and it it'll be an interesting test, you know, with WWE. Um, you know, not so much. I think SummerSlam will do fine. Um, WrestleMania is going to already for sure is doing going to do fine. But that Money in the Bank in Vegas is a real interesting one because it's like it's not considered a major show. There's another one four weeks later, which is SummerSlam, that's the, that is the major show. And you're looking in a place that's like a big NFL stadium. Um, I, I, they I was, very- when they announced it, Dave, I was there. And I I mean, there was such confusion with people that were in the building that they announced that Money in the Bank is going to be in that building. Where I, I don't think people, like, first of all, why? Why are you running that building for Money in the Bank? You know, and everybody's now speculating, well, is there a bigger plan here? Uh, I I was just very caught off guard when they put that on the screen. They said Money in the Bank, you know, ret- we're returning, you know, next year for Money in the Bank. Not even SummerSlam. I think the idea was that um, Nick's idea, you know, Nick's because because that was Nick Nick Khan's idea, yeah. just like the January first in Ella in Atlanta, is you know like holiday weekend, people will travel, people want to go to Vegas. And um, we can get people go, hey, you know, it's Vegas. Like, would they do money in the bank in St. Louis at a stadium? I think the answer is no. Yeah. Um, now, Royal Rumble in a stadium in St. Louis, yeah. But I think that the idea is it's a holiday weekend, and you can go, hey, we can go and, and see a WWE pay-per-view. Now, again, it's a test. I mean, maybe, you know, and, and how hot will WWE be this summer? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, there's so many things. I mean, it's a... We'll see. We'll see. I yeah. don't. I. I mean, and but but the thing is, if they can do that, I would be very confident AEW could go in there and do. Um, you know, the problem with uh, uh, an outdoor show in Chicago, you know, is is Chicago in September. I mean, it, it, the weather could be fine, but the weather in, at night could be absolutely brutal. Um, you know, Vegas is better. Man, maybe Vegas is the place. You know, maybe they're booking that stadium every year with with a proviso that we're in, and AEW can't go in with the idea that. Hey, if we go in, I mean, Vegas is, you know, I mean, like, like maybe a, you know, to make sure that AEW can't get the May date at the stadium rather than MGM Grand, very interesting, you know, something like that. Yeah, very um, interesting. Maybe you know, just just make it, you know, our friends at the stadium, we're going to do it. Don't book to these other people. Maybe that's part of the deal too. Well, listen, yeah, that's the story in New York, right? That's the story in New York with MSG and AEW did twenty twenty thousand. What is it? Nineteen eight legit. Uh, you know, I think it was a little over. It was a little over. It was right at a little over twenty in the building, but it was eighteen three paid. Eighteen three paid, still, which is still a fantastic. Oh my number god, for, it, I, Dave, I was there. I, I've been in that building from the time I was a kid. My grandfather was a big tennis lover. We would go all the time to the U.S. Open. It's six minutes from my house. I went there. We walked in. I couldn't believe how slammed that place was. You know, it's it's a yeah. really unique setup too. It's a very unique building. 
um, that they can't run year round because of the weather and, and the way that the tennis association is. So they'll probably get maybe two shows out of there a year if they can. But, you know, that's all because they were blocked out of MSG. Yeah. Yeah. And they came up with something unique. And I mean, the first show there, that was also part of it is they did a good job of advertising the, the, the first show in the New York market was going to be big. And it was in a venue that had never held wrestling. And they made that part of the thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that show was a, yeah, that show was a giant. Held success. anything, Dave. Held anything other than tennis. They ran, I think they did, um, uh, th- th- so the story, I don't know if you know this, but uh, this is what was said to me by someone in the city. The guy that ran the parks department didn't want to do anything other than tennis in that building. And the way that they have that lease agreement with the uh, United States Tennis Association in the city is that, uh, I'm not 100% on this, but I think they just paid the taxes and it's a $1 lease for like, whatever, 99 years or whatever that deal would be. And whoever was running the parks department has veto power and didn't want to do anything. So someone new came and they're like, yeah, let's do something. Let's do something really cool in Flushing Meadow Park. Uh, so this yeah. is all all new, cool, you know, new stuff. I, I would love to see other events in that building, but uh, very interesting, a very unique building. Uh, now that, you know, New York has in the New York metro area, we have so many state uh, arenas now. It's, it's out of control. You know, it's not a one or two game shop anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. You couldn't keep anyone out of the market that, that was strong enough because there's going to be an arena that, that's going to book them, yeah. yeah. Dave, I really appreciate you taking your time and coming on with me today. Okay, this cool. Was, I, this was I very really cool. enjoyed it. No, always, uh, you know, I'd love to have you on more. i got to have Brian on again. This is, you know, Wrestling Observer Live. This is your show. 20-some-odd years ago, I tuned in one day, and you and Brian were talking on IATA, and it kind of uh, changed the trajectory of my career. I keep telling you this. Every time I see you, I tell you this, and I'll keep telling <laughs> you this, too. My whole life career i would have been a lawyer if it wasn't for this oh. if it wasn't for wrestling observer live i would have been a lawyer i want you to know that <laughs> wow wow but you're kind of hurting my feelings now in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> that I derailed your life. no listen but derailed it fun, for the so best derailed it yeah. for the best i, I could not yeah. complain at all but uh again thanks a lot for coming on as always okay cool all right we'll thanks, talk dave. soon okay always okay dave Meltzer, everybody wrestling observer live